Uh, welcome to this incredibly exciting chat from some of the key creatives who brought you Horrible Histories. I'm Rihanna Dillon, I'm a film critic and long-time fan of Horrible Histories. I let out the biggest scream in the world when I got asked to do this panel. Um, it's really special to me. There have been books, theatre productions, TV series, and now, finally, a film, Horrible Histories, the movie, all about the Rotten Romans. So the scope and reach of Horrible Histories is almost unparalleled with fans all over the world, hopefully in this room, um, definitely standing right here. We're going to be talking about the success of the books and the series, both still going strong with publisher Scholastic and CBBC. And yes, every episode is now back on iPlayer, so... Go home, watch it. Um, we're going to be talking about the challenges faced by our panel when it comes to entertaining and educating children and what we can look forward to in the long-awaited big screen adventure, which is coming out later this month. So before we meet our panel, let's have a little look at the trailer for Horrible Histories, the movie. Doom! The chicken guts speak the future! Betrayal, conspiracy and death! In other words, it's a normal day in Rome, really. I am poison. All hail my son, Emperor Nero. Hail me. Right. Cheers, ma'am. Welcome to Britain, and you are welcome to it. Celtic queen called Boudicca has gone loco. I want to take on the Romans. You're not having a sword. Dad, please. I said no. They just go around taking whatever they want, marching all over everything. Guys, hold on. Now, who says I'm not ready to be a warrior? You can't keep a prisoner. It's hard work. You have to feed him. That is disgusting. You have to exercise him. Who's going to clean up after him? I am here, you know. My troops are smashed. We're to get the pieces. Who are these guys? Those are trees. I knew that. As thousands head to join Boudicca's rebellion, it is nose to tail out there. Oh. Get out there. Give it CX percent. Wow. I'll make me have a flush, Cedric. That's just a push. Let's bounce. Bye, bye. You seriously think the Romans can be bested by a girl? Bested. Brilliant, quite brilliant. I kind of like it here. Beautiful civilized Rome. With its brick walls and proper toilets. Sponge? Oh, thanks very much. I think we should limit your scroll time. What? Horrible Histories, the movie, Rotten Romans. Do you excuse me, I just need to nip to the loo. I've been lucky enough to see the film already, and spoiler alert, it's really funny. <laughs> um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about our panel to start with. Um, we have director Dominic Brigstock. So he started out at the BBC working with legends such as Barry Norman and Clive James. Big Barry Norman fan down here. Um, and then moved into comedy, directing sketch shows uh, like Smack the Pony, um, Armstrong and Miller, French and Saunders, and the excellent sitcoms Alan Partridge and Green Wing. And then in what I'm sure he considers the pinnacle of his career, he collaborated on creating the TV format of Horrible Histories, directing four out of the first five series. Caroline Norris next. So she made children's programmes for Granada TV and the BBC before moving into comedy, producing sh shows for Tracy Ullman, Caitlin Moran, Sharon Horgan and a whole host more. And it was uh, 2007 when Caroline teamed up with Dominic and Giles Pilbrow to create first the TV series of Horrible Histories with Lion Television for CBBC, as well as then producing the 2011 prom at the Royal Albert Hall. So now she's co-written the Horrible Histories movie with Giles and Jessica Swale, as well as producing. Giles Pilbrow is a writer, script editor, producer and cartoonist, whose credits include Have I Got News For You, Spitting Image, Mock the Week. And he also has an extensive experience of working in children's TV, having recently worked on Shaun the Sheep for Aardman, 101 Dalmatian Street for Disney and Scream Street for CBBC. Um, together with Caroline and Dominic, he founded Citrus Films and Television, also co-creating five series of the Horrible History spin-off, Gory Games, as well as comedy shows for ITV1 and Sky. And we wouldn't be here 
at all if it wasn't for the original author of Horrible Histories, Terry Deary, who is also joining our panel today. He writes for the stage, TV, films and radio, and is also a professional actor. You might have spotted him in the trailer. Um, over the past 40 years, he's published well over 300 fiction and non-fiction books, and his Horrible Histories series exploded onto the scene 26 years ago. And he has cameos in the TV series as well as the film. So please welcome Dominic Brigstock, Terry Deary, Caroline Norris, and Giles Pilbrow. Hi. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we can't really talk about the film without referencing the hugely successful television series. So, series eight is currently going out on CBBC, produced by Lion TV. So, take us back to the inception of the series. Why did Terry's writing lend itself so brilliantly to the screen? Um, I think what we took from Terry's books was his attitude, I mean, apart from all the information in them, but his attitude towards children was something that we really loved, which was that he treated children like they could make up their own minds about historical facts and he, they could be historians themselves. So I always think that as an eight-year-old, you don't really have much power. You know, people tell you things all the time and they know more than you. And Terry puts facts in his books that are things like he says, I bet your parents don't know this, or I bet your teacher doesn't know this. So he makes information exciting. And that was something that Treating children just like grown-ups who are just a bit smaller. That, that, at, that sort of attitude towards kids, treating them with respect, was really important to us. Also his ability to pick out things that kids are going to like in mm -hmm. history. They give easy access into the, the historical era, mm -hmm. which uh, yeah, we picked up on. The, the other thing I like, which builds on what Caroline said, which, which was, as somebody who studied history formally, um, was that he would present from history, different versions of a story and say, right, which one's true? You make up your own mind. And I love that because that is proper history. And it, it, it's challenging young people to go, oh, which of these versions might be true? What are the, you know, e even as far as saying these people had vested interests, so they will have told a certain story. It's all there in the books. It was actually, it, it's, it's proper history. And that, that's what I found really good about it. The other thing I really liked, and which Caroline and I, well, Caroline probably spotted before I did, which is that it's actually, what helped make it a TV show is that it's actually written as a sketch book. Right. So you have one page will be, you know, recipes, and the next um, will be why, why did the Vikings want to go to Britain, but it will be done as a travel ad, what's mm -hmm. appealing about the destination. And that, I mean, for, for people who'd made a living doing sketch comedy for some time mm -hmm. before that was, was a gift, because it translated very easily. And obviously then it had, it had cartoons from, Terry, from um, Martin as well, which m meant that we could use, uh, there was a visual style, and we thought we'd also put animations in because of, you know, to, to replicate that, that format of the books. Um, so, Terry, when you were turning your books into a TV series, was there the temptation to do a narrative arc like we see in the movie, um, or was it always going to be sketches? We started with uh, a narrative arc. We talked to lots of people, famous names, and we were going to set it in a ghost train at one point where you stepped off and you ended up in another era. Mm -hmm. And so I've turned that into a series of books instead called uh, Wigget's Wonderful Wax World, available in all good books. <laughs> Always working. <laughs> uh, and so it was eventually the fact that CBBC really pressed to turn it into a sketch show, which nobody had thought of before. It would have been so easy to do a narrative. Yeah. But the sketch show was absolute genius. And the second piece of genius was they didn't get children's writers to do it. Mm -hmm. They got top adult sketch show writers. Because children's shows, the format is to shout at children the louder you shout at them on screen, the more they'll understand. <laughs> um, which is something I have never been into. So that's what really turned it into a sketch show. It, it started off as a narrative arc and changed to a sketch show genius. So I'm coming at you with a hard question. What's the trick to writing a good horrible history sketch? 
<laughs> Everyone's looking at me. <laughs> You've written a few. Uh, th th uh, there are so many different kind of shapes of sketches that we've used. Uh, ones that are just standalone sketches, ones that are TV spoofs, uh, and they all have their kind of strengths. And I think we tend to sit together as a team and work out, here's the fact, here's the facts in Terry's books, here's how he's presented them. Obviously, something about food, we might do a cookery show, and so we kicked off first series with lots of cookery show sketches. Uh, then some some historical facts lend themselves to more of a kind of narrative story. So sometimes a fact might, has a start, middle and end, so that you've naturally got, and a funny end usually involving death of some sort, <laughs> but then, then you'll, you'll have that, that kind of sketch. Some lend themselves to adverts, obviously, which breaks up the sketch. We, the way we did the writing process was uh, Greg Jenner, who did all the historical research, would come in and we'd have a meeting with all the writers there and just go through the history of, say, we'd say, oh, we're doing the Tudors this week, and he'd go through all the stuff, and we would sort of brainstorm, and then people would pitch their ideas, and then we'd divide them up, and people would go and write them. And then once they brought them, sent them all back in, Dom and Giles and I would sit in a, in the, in a, in a room and read them out to, to, to ourselves, and then discuss what needed to happen to them. Um, to take them forward. But one of the things about... We, when we first started, we thought we were going to write silly sketches and then afterwards have the rat explain what the facts were. And then it turned out that the facts were more extraordinary than the jokes that you could write, really. So there was one uh, sketch very early on which was about uh, Middle Ages ordeals, Saxon ordeals, so trial by ordeal. And the first one was holding a red-hot iron bar and if you're... And if your, hand, if your wounds healed, you were innocent, you were innocent and, and if they didn't, you were guilty. And then there was one where you got dunked, you know, like dunk, dunked in a pond. And then and the, yeah, the sketch ended with a trial by cake, where somebody ate some cake, and if you choked to death, you were guilty, and if not, then you were innocent. And I was like, nah, cake is a bit of a sort of... It's a bit root one as a comedy thing. And they were like, no, that, that's, that's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't made that up. And we just realised that, 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 that history was more ridiculous than, than, than people could imagine. So uh, history's a gift, really. <laughs> the, the process we used as well was just, well, Caroline is ruthless. It's, that's not fun enough. Could it be funnier? <laughs> so even on a draft three of a sketch, we'd look at it and just go, it's just not quite working. Is there a different way of, can we reskin it in a different shape? Mm -hmm that will actually give it an energy and a drive and you know, make what's currently not funny on the page actually funny. So, uh, yeah, we're just uh, same with all scripts, I'm sure, just keep punching away until it's actually working. So I hope that's what... My, my recollection of, of that process was the, the first when we were... <laughs> sorry? Have I painful. 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 <laughs> well, it, it, the first few weeks were yeah. while we struggled to find an identity, but this is, we're talking about 10 years ago now, um, where we were trying to work out what the style and what the flavour and what the tone was. Mm. And um, my recollection is that the first sketch that came in and we went, this is what it should be, and I'm probably wrong, was Larry Rickard wrote a sketch about, during the Second World War, if the Germans invaded, in order that they would not be able to find their way around, they took down all the signs at railway stations. Mm -hmm. And we went, well, how would you know where you are? Yeah. So the logical extension of that was, <coughs> what would they do? And it is completely absurd. And, and they, they're saying, well, how will we know where we are? And he says, well, I'll, I'll announce it. And somebody says, but what if there's a German in the car? Yeah. And it, it <laughs> escalates from that. And it's a gloriously Python-esque, ridiculous situation. It turns out in the end that there is a German in the in the carriage, and he says, well, would it help if I just got out of the train? <laughs> jumps off. But we read this, and we went, this is a classic comedy sketch, yeah. but it tells you something about history, and we went, this is how it will yeah, work. Kind of and, and, and actually, we, when we first started, we did a, a little mood reel of uh, things from other shows that reflected the sort of comedy that we wanted to have in the show, and one of those... I mean, I'm only slightly obsessed with the life of Brian, but uh, is, um, <laughs> as a wheel, yeah, is uh, the the stoning sketch in the in the life of Brian. We put that at a scene. It's not a sketch, and we put that in, and we said, "Look, you learn that you got stoned for blasphemy, and that women weren't allowed at stonings, and that men dressed up as women." <laughs> <laughs> but that was. We said that this is a, this is the sort of thing we want. So it was, and there was Blackadder. I mean, you said uh, that Richard Curtis said. Um, that he was very proud after they made the Elizabethan series of Blackadder to have bought the Ladybird book of uh, 
Elizabeth I and find, found that all the facts in there were in Blackadder. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I mean, famously, Horrible Histories is cross-generational. Mm. Um, so how do you keep that balance? Of the, the comedy is so at the fore of it. So how do you keep the balance of jokes that children understand and ones that they're, adults... They're well? all jokes. They're all aimed at children. So we don't do jokes that... We don't do sort of fanar, fanar, all adults will get that, but children won't. Right. Children have to understand. They might not understand some of the references. Adults might laugh at that, but what we didn't want is adults laughing at stuff that kids would be going, why are you laughing at that and I'm laughing at this? And to be honest, we're really childish, and so we <laughs> just did jokes that made us laugh. We basically said, let's make a sketch show that just doesn't have any swearing in it. Mm -hmm. And that was it. <laughs> it should be the same quality as anything else we make for, for adult television or anything else. We just come off Armstrong and Miller, so, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, we, we, we just told the, the very best jokes we could think of. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, just being very boring about a, his, a bit of history, probably very few people in this room are old enough, Terry and I probably old enough, to remember <laughs> a show <laughs> uh, which was called Do Not Adjust Your Set, which was on Rediffusion. Who remembers Rediffusion? <laughs> in the late 60s. And... It was a show that, as a kid, I never missed. Right. And it, it was a, a sketch show, and it was extraordinary and, and um, behaved very badly and, and did all sorts of things. I remember one of the presenters was naked at one point. <laughs> it was Eric Idle, it was uh, Terry Jones, it was Michael Palin. And they were doing a, a, an entertainment for young people, but it, it was just jokes. And, and uh, we did the same, really. Um, you know, pe pe people having buckets of poo tipped over them on the kit jars here. It's funny whatever age you are. That's <laughs> true. Um, don't I'm worry, it's not going to happen. The, all, the poo, <laughs> all the poo jokes. <laughs> Mostly jars, yeah. Um, we are very grateful for that. Um, <laughs> what I was so impressed about when I saw the film was just every scene is just stuffed with detail. Like the, there are so many visual gags and jokes, some blink and you miss it moments. How do you fit it all in? I mean, who kind of oversees because you're looking at a screen and there's something going on in sort of like every quarter. Well, I don't know who's going to take responsibility. I think it's, we are a, a, it's a team effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Giles is always stuffing extra jokes in. But, yeah. It's always fun if you can add up the joke count, even in the edit. You yes. know, well, we're doing something right here. <laughs> so we, were added, we added a few little visuals at the yeah, end. Yeah, there were some establishers of Rome. And it's Giles's instinct to go... Where's the joke? Where's the joke? Where's the added thing we can put in here? Giles is a cartoonist uh, as well. And so he's always looking for little visual cartoony kind of gags. So there's a... There's a Romansky, isn't there? There's, there's a, a Romansky bank Banksy. There's a Banksy. <laughs> if you look very carefully, there's a Roman throwing up. And then there's a sign. We just added them afterwards because we were going, yes. oh, we didn't put any jokes in those. And there was there's a sign which is no... Pig's blood Pig's games, blood games here. and then and then there's another one, and we were going, "What are we going to do in this one?" And there's a pillar, and we just basically put the Monty Python foot on. Yeah, look, yeah, <laughs> right on top of the tall pillar, there's a little CGI yeah. foot of Terry. It's Gilliam's actually my foot. foot. It's like Terry Gilliam's foot. <laughs> it's like Terry. Gilliam's foot. Yeah. Yeah, so there's little hard. references like that in there. But, um, but, but to, to add to that, we have a very very great team of people mm -hmm. who, uh, almost everyone who worked on the movie had worked on the first few series of the TV show. Mm -hmm. So there's a pedigree there and that they are brilliant at what they do. And so they're contributing a great deal themselves. Um, and that's, you know, so it makes it much easier for there's them. There's a Lee Mack ad lib, which makes me laugh. Yeah. Which yeah. Uh, they, all the Romans are in a testudo and Lee Mack walks out and he can't help himself. He doesn't, and he says, uh, <laughs> I didn't know it was raining. <laughs> and uh, it's just, it's a, I don't deliver it, Lee did. And it's just a great <laughs> joke. So uh, as writers, we get to take credit for his ad lib and pretend that we came up with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that kind of brings us on to the, the casting, because do you need to have a cast that is recognisable for children, or is it more important to have a cast that parents recognise, because, let's face it, they're the ones taking their kids to the cinema? I think the important thing was that we had people who were right for the roles, who could deliver the comedy and... Uh, and were funny. I mean, um, we're, you know, when we got Kate Nash to be Boudicca, I mean, it was just so... We were just saying, we, we, we met her, I took my dog along, because my dog will persuade anyone to be in anything, and she, she really <laughs> likes animals. I was going, we'll take the dog. And we thought we were going to have to persuade her to do this role. And, and, um, and we were... 
having a chat and she was saying, do you know, I'm obsessed with Boudicca. I've always wanted to play Boudicca. I'm, you know, this is, this is my dream role. And we were going, oh, sorry, we thought we were here to persuade you to do the role. <laughs> and, she, and so we said, well, do you want to do it? And she said, do you want me to do it? And we were going, yes. We were, and we were all so excited. And she is so brilliant. We were yeah. looking for a, someone who could sing, someone who had really great performing chops because the songs for her were quite, you know, they're quite a challenge. And, you know, there she was. Uh, and, and Derek Jacobi wanted to do it. We could hardly turn him down. Well, De yeah, the, De <laughs> Derek Jacobi, we wrote that scene. And this isn't, I think I'm quite old, not as old as you two, but. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Terry's just here to be the old one. And I, it was the first thing I was allowed to stay up and watch was I, Claudius. And so when we wrote the scene with Claudius's death in it, we wrote, he does say, I travel to the underworld in the knowledge that I, C C Claudius, and I just said, this has to be Derek Jacobi. Can somebody go and ask him? And that's an example of a joke which will make adults laugh, yeah. but kids, does it, it doesn't exclude children. It's not a joke. That's not like a, it's not like a rude joke that they're not supposed to understand. They can ask about it. I and mean, he'd never done the death scene, had he? So No. Not as Claudius. I mean, that just sets us up perfectly. I don't even need to be here because we're just going to play the clip so you can all see. Oh, right, see. great. Exactly. We have to get off the stage for this. <laughs> Dying as Claudius. <laughs> Darling, you can't be too careful. <laughs> Doctor, come quickly. It's my husband. What's the matter? He's not dying. Not dying. Between me and you, Mother poisoned him with some mushrooms, but he's thrown them up. So I want you to tickle his throat with this poisoned feather and finish the job. I couldn't possibly. Or you'll be next. Mm. Emperor? No, really, I'm feeling okay now. Open wide. Say, ah! Uh... Yeah! Yes, get in. Sorry, can I? Who's in charge now? All hail my son, Emperor Nero. 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 Hail me. Cheers, ma'am. Ruler of the whole Roman Empire, even that stainy bit. Except I'll be ruling until you come of age. What? No, that's not for another five years. Thank you. Gosh, to think Derek Jacobi's career started with Claudius and we've just finished. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never work again. How have you got to the point where you're sort of turning down people because you can't fit them all in? Because but there were some people who wanted to be in the film, but there wasn't the right role for them, but they're in my head so that uh, they will not escape if we make another one, then... Uh... I think it started with a television series where we had people like Rowan Atkinson. You know, you think, how did you get Rowan Atkinson? <laughs> and the gentleman... League of. Le League of gentlemen, you know, <laughs> them. And it's, wow! P people that uh, I'm in awe of, mm -hmm. you know? Mm. Can, I, can I just say about that clip? Um, the, the old gentleman who was thrown off the... Um, Shays Long <laughs> was not Derek Jacobi, but, but Sir Derek did say you didn't need a stuntman. I'm quite happy to be thrown <laughs> off. <laughs> Bless him. We, did, we, we didn't roll him off the bench. <laughs> we did want to send him home in one piece. Um, Terry, I have to ask, I know you've been asked a million times, but how did Horrible Histories come to exist in the first place? A million and one. one. <laughs> yeah, sorry, take that. Father Christmas joke book. Um, where, what is Tarzan's favourite Christmas song? Jungle Bells. <laughs> it was a great success. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, will you write a history joke book? Yeah, I can do I was just a journeyman writer. Where did the French buy their guillotines? <laughs> In the chopping centre. Oh. These jokes, the publisher said, they're a bit, um, you know, <laughs> bad. <laughs> Can we put in some interesting history facts? I'm not a historian, mate. I'll get some researchers to do it. So, guillotines. How did the French test their guillotines? Fact. What would you use? I use this all the time. What would you use to test the guillotine? You've got a, a royal there. You're going to chop it. You don't want to hurt them. Mm. Really? <laughs> you know? <laughs> What are you going to test it on? Uh, animal? Meat? Yeah, that's good, yeah. No. Oh, right. Watermelon? <laughs> Corpses from the oh, local God. mortuary. <laughs> and then you start to think, hang on, who could do that? Who could pick up a corpse, put them on the machine, cut off its head, then pick up the bits? <laughs> 
And you think, this is really interesting mm. because this is what history's good at, and especially horrible histories, measuring yourself against the past. Who, when I was a, a drama student, my, my tutor always said, the purpose of drama is to answer one question only. Why do people behave the way they do? And then I've added, extended that to, why do I behave the way I do? And the only way you can measure yourself is by looking at other people, in the news or in the past. I just happened to use the past for horrible histories. So that's how it started. A comedy, a joke book with facts became fact books with jokes, and the rest is... Um... <laughs> <laughs> You can tell he's done this before. <laughs> um, something which contributes, contributes so much, I think, to the success of the TV series are the songs. Everyone loves the songs. So tell me about sort of, you know, it's one thing to write a script, but quite another to write a song. So, so the you... songs are, I worked on Live and Kicking in the late 90s with uh, the legendary Chris Bellinger. Uh, and when Trevor and Simon left, it was Zoe and, Ball, Zoe, and, Zoe and Jamie years, and Trevor and Simon did their last year on Live and Kicking, the first year, and then, and then the, for the second two years of that series, uh, they were replaced by the men in trousers, who were um, Ben Ward, Jess Foster, and Richie Webb, who were half of a radio group called Cheese Shop, which also includes Dave Lamb of Come Dine With Me fame who's in the movie. Uh, I don't let go of anyone, they're all... <laughs> I save them all up. Um, Richie wrote songs and wrote songs for... Uh, and wrote music and things, and he had a series on Radio 4 called 15 Minute Musicals. And I said to him... And they, that was sort of parody songs and that kind of thing. So I rang him up and I said, we want to have some songs in our, in our show. And Dave Cohen, who wrote the lyrics for Richie for 15 Minute Musicals, we got him to come in. So basically, generally what happens is that we have an idea that's... Uh, so we talked about Nero and we said, what should his song be? Uh, I think the description of it in the script is co cocaine era Elton John. <laughs> 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 Which when we sent it to the, to the people who give you the certificate, they said, the BBFC, they said, uh, there's no actual cocaine, is there? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, so we said a, a cocaine era, Elton John, and it's and it's about him and he's and I was I had this idea one day that it was that the line should be, isn't it funny how I don't need my mummy, because uh, it's all about him being independent and getting rid of her, and then sort of gave that to Dave and then he goes away and writes the writes the information. So we tell him what we want to get in and he writes these amazing words and then we just sort of workshop it the same way we workshop other scripts and then Richie writes the music. With the Kings and Queens song from the series, I don't know if you've seen that, basically we got to the stage where we were saying, all these kids are learning our words, let's, let's do something which, where they accidentally learn all the Kings and Queens things, <laughs> that'd be, be funny. <laughs> it was Giles's idea, and he said, you should do that. So I gave it to Dave, who wrote this song, which was about this long, and then um, I tried to rewrite it, and, then, and anyway, we ended up with this song, which I sent to Richie, and he literally rang me up and said, are you joking? <laughs> 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 this is going to be a five-minute song. And we were going, oh, no, no, anyway. And he, and he rang me back a couple of days, and a couple of days later and said, what about if it's Chaz and Dave, and we just, it gets faster and faster? And we were going, yeah, perfect. <laughs> And it was, but that happened. I'd have given up, but because Giles didn't have to make it, he kept saying, "No, it'd be great. Yeah, just do it, do it." And I was like, "Oh God, different people yeah. shooting something." I'll make and, it a and series. So it, yeah. <laughs> and so it was. Re but, but once we cracked that, yeah, it was brilliant. So Richie is very much a part of that, and he's done the music for this. And then when we did the prom at the Royal Albert Hall, we were introduced to a, a guy who orchestrated all the music who in fact you will have seen at the Olympics opening ceremony playing the piano with Mr Bean. That guy is a guy called Ian Farrington. He's really brilliant. And he and Richie and he met on the prom and then they did the, the score for the film as well. So it's all people that I've gathered through my career or that people know from other, other shows. So, because Caroline's so in, in, ingrained in that, you, what I remember is I, I didn't direct the first series and I remember watching it come together from our original script writing and, and, and the magic of it. And I remember the first song that caught my eye was The, the Four Georges, yeah. which was the first time that you did a parody of a style. You, yeah. you thought of The Four Georges as a boy band. Well, what happened with that was that I... The brilliant thing about Horrible Histories is that I was able to say to Greg, what is the Georgian era? 
I, I mean, I did history A level, and I thought, well, it must be King George must have been on the, the throne, but which one? Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, no, 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 and he started talking me through, and I just went, oh, my God, that's brilliant. That's a song, let's do a song. And then I think it was Dave who wrote it like Westlife. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and yeah, that definitely was the thing that we went, oh, look, that really works. So the first, the first series has some different, some songs that are not so, not, not parodies. And uh, we realized that that really worked. Wasn't there, there was one episode in the first series that doesn't have a song and just, did you, you re read something where somebody had said that they'd watched it and they didn't have a song in it and their child had cried. <laughs> <laughs> so we realised after that where we had to put a song in every episode. <laughs> Ruiner of children's lives. But as, as a director, that's a gift because, you know, come the second series, we had Charles II rapping mm -hmm. and we had the Vikings as soft rock American guitar axe heroes uh, who literally had axes. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, as a director, you've immediately got a style to w a starting point of how it's yeah. going to look. Mm -hmm. And although you know, with the, with a budget of very little to do that style of thing, you've you've got a shorthand that makes it possible to create something that mm -hmm. looks much more expensive than it is because you're basically copying other people's ideas, <laughs> um, which is saves a lot of time, obviously. Yeah. yeah. The, the other key ingredient to the kids series, we've mentioned all these sort of different sketch formats, but to help tie it into the book, to surf on the success of the book, we did a lot of graphics quite late in the day in the edit. Mm. I can't remember what stage we decided, let's, let's, let's do the packages by animating the book covers, give them a little bit of movement. We already had, we had the idea of animating them, but we thought they were just going to bring sketches on, and then we showed the first series, we did, you did a cut together of the first episode, and then showed it in a, we went took it to a school yeah, yeah, yeah. and showed it to a class and they we'd 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 given the kids so much credit that we hadn't bothered introducing any of the sketches and they had no idea what was going on <laughs> and Giles rang me up and said um they looked out the window they looked out the window they didn't know they didn't know which bit of history it's, they were in if, if, if a child's in a conversation where they go oh right this isn't for me this is about stuff that I don't really understand or that they've used I'm, I'm not with this they're gone so an adult will watch a sketch going I don't know what this is about but I'm interested to find out whereas a child will go I don't know what this is about I'm gone so what we realized cause it was a really funny sketch about decimation and reading out names which we thought this is a great classic Monty Python-esque style sketch very silly but with a good fact at its heart um, this was that if you ran away in the face of the enemy each tenth Roman legionary was uh, was decimated, basically, hence decimation. So nice gory fact at its heart. Any case, the kids didn't like it at all. They were looking out the window. And we realised very quickly that what you need is just to say to the children, uh, we had a little animated one of Martin's characters popping up and saying to the to the viewer, uh, you won't believe, you know, our, our generals were really brutal. You won't believe what they did if we ran away in the face of the enemy. So then the child goes, oh, right, this is what it's about. And then they go with. So once you make sure that... They're never lost. You told a story and led them through it. They then watched it and enjoyed it. So we sort of retrofitted about... We always had the rat to explain certain things afterwards. But we used and sometimes well, And sometimes. We, you didn't just, just want the rat. So the animated yeah. characters. So, but it helped knit yeah, the series the animators, the books. The animators had a lot more work to do than they had anticipated. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we did about 80 little um, inserts that we hadn't planned. Mm. Um, there are quite a few creative partners, I think we've kind of realised through talking about. You've got... Citrus, your company, CBBC, Altitude Films, Scholastic, who published Terry's books, and Lion TV, who make the current series. So how do you collaborate with so many different partners involved in a project like the Horrible Histories movie? Delicately. <laughs> <laughs> Diplomatically. Yeah. Now, Altitude came to us and said, uh, have you ever thought about making a Horrible Histories film? And we said, yeah, we'd love to. And they knew how to make that happen. They knew how to raise the money and and actually they're, they're a distribute they are both a production company and a distribution company and distribution I don't really know anything about films I know I've made one but uh, <laughs> but, uh, but apparently the distribution bit is, is is you know that's the company that you get to distribute your film is everything because that's how much they're going to put and because they were involved as producers and Will Clark is, is a is the other producer on the film they are complete, that were completely invested in it from the beginning. So they've got this huge campaign, which you'll start to see more of in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and he's really got behind it. But they also raised the money and gave us the casting director who knew how to get the sort of cast we needed. And 
so they they were brilliant and we've worked with uh, with terry and lion you know on the tv series so we knew them already and, mm-hmm. and we've worked um, with cbbc I mean, obviously and cbbc we've worked with for years i mean we, yeah it, it all goes back years because richard bradley of lion i knew because i'd talked to him about history program ideas years ago we were both working in dot features at the bbc caroline had worked in children she and i were working mm-hmm. together on armstrong and miller richard was looking for somebody to help him develop it you knew Anne Gilchrist at the BBC. From CBBC from so, Live and Kicking. So right, it, so it's, it's all a, this network. It, it was a network of people. And Melissa, together, who's so. our exec on, yeah. um, um, CBBC exec on the film, we, I knew from from CBBC. So you know, uh, yeah, we've. And all... Will knows everyone in the film department, so yeah. there was. And we it me- meshes nice. Yeah. Um, so much of history is hearsay or rumor or misquoted. So how do you decide what to represent? Because. As we all know, as soon as it's on film, it's fact. So <laughs> how do you kind of make sure that you're getting the right stuff through? Well, because I'm not a historian, I've learned from reading history books mm-hmm. and I've realised that most historians are charlatans, frauds, seedy and devious as a politician. Yeah. If you've got 10 facts to play with and you want to make your name, you pick the five that will prove your case Mm -hmm. and you ignore the other five and pretend they're not there. And basically, that's what I do in my books. (laughs) I've got an agenda, which is anti-establishment, and if there's anybody nice in the establishment, they don't get mentioned. (laughs) I just pick the the nasty people, and it is not history. Horrible histories are not history books. They are books about people, about human nature. Um, and I get endless, endless emails. I read your horrible histories when I was a kid, and now I do history at university. Don't blame me, mate. <laughs> we also have, we also have, so, te- so Greg does our history research, and he tells us what the current thinking is, mm-hmm. which is why we did a, a song all about how Richard III did not have a hunch back and then they dug him up and he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there is a, a certain, you know, you it's choose the facts that, that tell the story. I mean, but, but we have at the end of the film said, does anyone know what happened to Boudicca and have explored, there are three different versions of what people think might have happened to her and nobody knows which one's true because obviously the Romans tell, tell their version and, and then there was a Greek historian who told a different version. And, and that goes back to what we were saying about yeah. that's what Terry that's does. What he gives Terry children, does. He, he gives mm-hmm. children the, the ability to make up their own minds mm-hmm. and that's what we try and do because I think that's a really important thing. Yeah, but the best one is she's buried under Platform 8 at King's Cross Station. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the one I'll go for every time. I thought it was Harry Potter who's buried under Platform 8. <laughs> <laughs> who's he? <laughs> Um, I think we've only got about five minutes left, so I'm going to open it up to the audience. If you've got a question, please stick your hand up and uh, we'll have a mic come to you. Uh, yeah, we've got a gentleman right down in the front. Sorry I'm making you run all that way. Somebody at the back put the hand up now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, yeah, shall I stand up? Um, just wanted to say, you mentioned the university part. I actually want to say thank you to the panel, I think. Um, I'm off to study history at university because of that. <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd have to say it, but you have you have genuinely inspired a generation to go and study history at university. So. We'll all blame you when it goes wrong. Um, no, I mean, like I could, I won't do it, but I could rap Charles II. So I mean, we've got. Go on, do it. Do it. I opened that up for me, didn't it? It's like. I love the people and the people love me so much. So we saw the English mind. I could, yeah, there are so many we could do. Um, but I was wondering, do you think this is exclusive to... I mean, could you do this sort of model with, with other stuff? I met, you know, you mentioned it started to mock the week and Tracy Ullman's show. Do you reckon this sort of model, if you had the same writers, could work with politics, with sciences, um, and inspire generations in, that, in that area, those areas uh, as well? Well, one, what Terry said about his books aren't about history, they're about people. Um, a sketch show is about people and it tells stories about... So any sketch show that you make is, is about different kinds of characters and people. And we did look at... I mean, there is a, there is a science series which Ben Miller made a TV series out of, but we looked at that and we... Because um, we're not scientists either, but it's the, for, our, for us, it's the people that make the comedy. And so it's more difficult to do something with facts. I mean, we make... Dom and Giles and I work on Tracy Ormond together as well. And, you know, so we do do political stuff. We've made, we've made political sketch shows. 
And yeah, it is. A lot of them are the same writers. <laughs> so yes, I mean, uh, you know, sketches are sketches, but. Uh, but I'm not sure they inspire people to go into politics. No. <laughs> not so much. I, I think what we discovered, as, as Caroline already said, um, is that once you start digging into history, the characters and the things that they got up to are so absurd and so ridiculous, they lend themselves to comedy very easily. And, and when they're we looked, dead, so they can't sue. And that's true. You can say anything you like about them. Um, <laughs> But if you look at science, it's all quite serious. If, the, if there was something funny in science, we tended to do it in Horrible Histories. Mm. Um, we did the people. But um, other than that, it's, it's all quite dull. serious. Not dull, but it, it's that just... It's difficult to find the joke in it. Um, that's the thing. Yeah. Thank you. That was a really good question. Uh, yes, we have Chap over there with his hand up. Hi, thanks. It's been a great panel. Um, do you think the books and the TV show has had an impact on the way history is taught in schools or in the expectations kids have of history when they go to school? Like, if they've read of these books, are they expecting their teachers to be different? Well, uh, uh, I did, when I did my history A-level, the, basically the only thing I remembered afterwards was that James the first tongue was too big for his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because that fact... Because you go, oh, imagine trying to be king when your tongue is too big for your mouth. That's so, uh, but it's exactly that. It's about imagining yourself in those in those positions and what it might, how it might make you feel. So uh, that, that, and I thought that was a really inspiring thing that my history teacher told us. And so yes, I think they used. The, I think they, a lot of teachers use our sketches. I hope history is more fun than you know than it has been in the past. They um, definitely use it if it's if it's raining and. Uh, <laughs> And breaks cancelled. They yeah. bung on our horrible histories. This is uh, I know this from my daughter, and, and pretend that that's a little bit of education. Yeah, the, I, I, my my analogy for this was always that I knew the Lord's Prayer from school, and so if I went to a church service, there's a bit of it that I understood, and that I didn't feel completely alienated from it. So I could sit through a church service and go, oh, I know this bit, and that's what I wanted to come out of this was that was that people would say, well, I, you know, I know the basic story of Helen of Troy from our stupid photo love story <laughs> with, with Sarah Adland. Because I, I, do, I didn't know anything about Greekness, and I was able to sort of go, here are the basics, and then you can go and read up, but you know broadly what the story is. So if it's a grain of something that inspires you to go and find out more, then that, I think, is, is the best thing that the show can mm -hmm. have done. My, my history teaching consisted of the teacher coming in and saying, right, open at page 132, right, right, Jones, you, you start reading. And for 40 minutes, somebody would read from the book and we'd look out the window. Um, so I desperately hope that the teaching I was subjected to has changed as a result of this series. But mm -hmm. I, I mean, we'd have to go back to school and be pupils to find out whether that's actually the case. <laughs> but as Giles said, that they, they obviously regard it, some teachers regard it as a useful thing that they can put on as if it has some sort of beneficial effect and it's part of I think it's kind of rather than just so a list of facts, which is definitely what history was back in my day. And a date list. Date list and something yeah. really turgid and miserable like that. Now, uh, Horrible Histories, what's brilliant about Terry's books and attitudes, it sort of draws the kids in to feel like what it would be like to be in that environment, what it must be like to be a Victorian child in a factory. And that's suddenly so much more interesting than finding out you know, when Victoria was born, and just, just a list of facts. So I think they're, they're drawn in, so they suddenly have a feel for the era. Then you want to know the facts on top of that, rather than just have the facts force-fed. I have learnt far more from working on horror histories than I ever did in three years of mm. education. I now know what three the Georgian years, era is. Three, three years. years. <laughs> I, I only did history for three years. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> but it, yeah, I remember almost nothing of that. I remember a great deal. Yeah, I did only go to school for three years. <laughs> <laughs> but that's um, another story. We've got time for one more question. Uh, yeah, right next to you, nice and easy. I was wondering how you decided to focus on the storyline that you picked for the film when you have this huge uh, range of historical options. Yeah, why um, the Rotten Romans? Be honest, come on. Well, no, uh, the, the on. honest answer is that uh, Altitude said uh, that in terms of what would work as a movie and as a first movie, they felt that it ought to have a very British... Mm -hmm. uh, a very, a very, it used to be, ought to be a very British story, and yet they needed something that was also an international story. So uh, the Romans are very useful for that. And we were not sure about it to start with because we thought it might just look like a Python film, and we were a bit worried that it wouldn't look distinctive enough. But then, then we settled on the idea of doing the Boudicca Rebellion. 
and we loved the idea that there was a powerful woman, uh, and there's not that many women female stories in history, so it was really Im it was really important that we had a we had some great uh, female history, uh, and. Yeah, so it was kind of in, co in, in collaboration with Altitude we came up with, with that era. Yeah, I mean, uh, the other part that Altitude put in was that they wanted some sunshine in it. And mm. we assumed that shooting in Britain in September, it would look a bit grey and damp. And that the section set in Rome would be sunny and warm. Of course, what we did was shoot it in the sunniest September <laughs> on record. And so Britain looks glorious and uh, Rome luckily also looks sunny. But we have been asked to tone down the colour in some of the British scenes because it, <laughs> it looks too beautiful. Um, but that, that was going to give us a contrast as well. Um, and yeah, as you say, the, the nero Boudicca conflict is, is a fabulous story, which, which we... Uh, and we always knew we were going to do a fictional story within a factual setting because the fictional story allows you to do the social history, the food and the you know how people lived and those sorts of things and it allows you to do a, a, a narrative that draws children through if you're just trying to do the history often history doesn't lend itself to a sort of three act narrative or it doesn't end the way you want it to end or whatever so it was very useful to have those historical characters in the background and then have our fictional characters foreground so um yeah it worked very well so rotten romans is out in a couple of weeks, I think. July the 26th. July 26th. Yeah. Make sure you all go and see it. Um, thank you so much for joining us on stage. We actually have a special Sheffield themed thank you gift for oh. all of you. Yeah. So, do you want to come up on stage Cutlery. and give us <laughs> <laughs> a good mic, me? Yeah. Thank you. thank you very much. Is it a spoon? Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Please give it up one more time for Dominic, Terry, Caroline and Giles. Thank you.